It was an extraordinary week in the fallout to the Crows camp last week and this was set alight by Eddie Betts and his book. It triggered a whole raft of former players coming forward including Josh Jenkins and Bryce Gibbs specifically and different views around the football world. I was, I was hurting and, and I was, I was um, you know, having this pain and feeling sick and you know, just what I've, what I've been through and, and I just sat down and told everything that, that we did. And, and that was kind of a breach of what we weren't meant not to do. And frankly, some of the stuff that went on was a, was a disgrace. And clearly, uh, you know, we were hearing him and hear his pain and we're sorry. And I'm here largely because no one has yet taken responsibility for what went on and the acceptance that what did go on was completely unacceptable. With, with Eddie and Josh, the fact that you know they feel the personal information they provided was used against them is, is disappointing, and that's that's yeah, you know, that's unacceptable. And you know, we'd, um, I'm, I'm saddened by that. I'm sorry by that. I feel like the decisions made to do some of these things, it, it, it ended careers. I think we can move forward, but we'd like to say sorry to Eddie and anyone else that had um, that had a negative experience throughout the camp. If someone would have directed that sort of language towards me in that situation where I, if you're setting the terms of engagement that we're going to you know, point fake guns at you and we're going to make this the most physical and tough and we're going to sort of isolate you out in front of a group out in the bush, to be quite frank, I would have reacted so extremely aggressive to whoever directed that at me. Like, you know, I would have probably picked up something and tried to flog you with it. And tonight, an open letter from the chairman and CEO at the Crows addressed the changes that have been made, Caro, since. And also in the second paragraph there, the cultural shift and the focus on uh, the different priorities and the evolution not, of... Not quite accurate. I mean, the Indigenous players felt that maybe they should have been more strongly consulted when Taylor Walker was re-signed. And there have been a lot of changes at the Crows, but there is still the head of footy... Director of Footy, Mark Rusciuto. Let's, let's pick the about. conversation up there on Mark Rusciuto. Sam McClure, who has driven this story, he famously won an award for it, was rescinded and then reinstated. He joins us. Sam at the Plasma. Mark Rusciuto, how safe is he in his role? And how does he address the increased focus on him from here? Thanks, Archie. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting question. And, and listening to that fallout, I think, is nothing short of tragic to see what's happened over the last few days. But to use, from a news perspective, to use a Damien Hardwickism, let's go one step back before we take two steps forward and just have a look. We know what it did to the playing group. But what about the club as an administration and a footy department? Rob Chapman famously said, well, now infamously said, he went on worse business camps than what happened at the Adelaide camp. Andrew Fagan always said that there was nothing wrong with what happened at the camp until more people came out. Don Pike... They stopped using Collective Mind after the camp. He was one of the men that d drove them back when they started losing games. So they used Collective Mind after it. And Brett Burton held a press conference with Don Pike saying that they used to sit back and laugh about some of the media reports. No one is laughing now. Mark Rusciuto is the only person left that, is, that was there when the camp happened that was, according to reports, part of the team that was briefed as to what was going to happen on the camp. We'll get to that a little later in an article written by Graham Corns. And now there's reports from Sam Edmund at SEN um, this morning, Caroline, that there is pressure starting to mount on Mark Rusciuto and his position. I think that's right. My prediction would be that Mark Rusciuto will be here till the end of the year and then serious pressure will come upon him. Not pressure from himself. He's digging in, Craig. That, that's surprising in itself, isn't it? Like, he surely can't survive this. Oh, I, just impossible to me. I mean, he, he was a staunch defender, Sam, obviously, of Brett Burton, who was his man, yep. who was one of the key instigators of the camp. And, you know, the comments he made last week was so bad from a Crows point of view. It caused a lot of angst within and without the club. Caused Big quite a bit of hurt with some of the Saturday players. Saturday morning at the yep. Crows where this was discussed. Mark Rusciuto continued to dig in, was telling people at the footy on Sunday that he felt he was going to survive. My view, he won't survive. Feels like they need clean air, Caro. And Mark uh, Rusciuto himself has applauded those that have stood down to give clubs historically that clean air. You can only make your decisions really at the end of the year and Don, after getting through the season, having a bit more time to think about it, thought that this was the right decision for him and the club and I think it's extremely brave and courageous what he's doing for himself and also for the footy club. I'm a big Eddie Maguire fan. I think he's done an amazing job and I think he's done the right thing by stepping down and giving the club some clean air to move forward and become an even better club than perhaps what they are. So it's going to be really difficult for the club to get that clean air while Mark Rusciuto is still there. Yeah, it's a really good 
point, Cornsy. And, and I think the next part of that, we've talked a lot about, Caro, in the last couple of years, the potential cover-up and to what extent that it went. And I know that there's been apologies. I know there's been elements of contrition. But I stand here today still wondering who is going to take responsibility for some of the things that went on at that camp. Because we've heard different accounts now, and I'll take you to um, something that Graham Corns um, wrote um, for News Limited Papers very recently, and that was an element of, well, who knew? And the Adelaide Football Club, according to Collective Mind, who uh, ran the camp, said that they were fully briefed on this. Wolf, that's Amon Wolf, said Derek Letty, who's another part of Collective Mind, said Andrew Fagan and the club's board had full awareness of the program and that one of the club's coaches even pilot tested Hutchie, a version of what went on. That has to be answered for. The Adelaide Football Club either need to come out and say that is completely wrong and we had no idea what the, what the players were going to put through or say that, yep, we knew and we let it happen because they're two very differing versions of events. Sam, you said before that uh, Mark Rashid had been briefed. Is that what you said before on what was going to happen in the camp? Well, that, I'm saying that... Um, that the people who ran the camp said that they briefed the CEO and the head of football. And but you would think the director, the board director, would have oversight of that. Because whoever what, listened to that and let it keep going, they well, can't in their right mind have said that Brit you'll give information and it'll be used against you. Whoever heard that and then allowed for that to happen must go. It was Brett Burton's football department. Yeah. Mark Rashido's man was Brett Burton. Yep. The buck and, stops and there are still denials well going on to this day. I just want to say one thing before we go to the next part of this, and that is for Gillan McLaughlin to take four years, given that he's known since 2020 what went on, or the AFL has known what has gone on, to actually apologise in a stand-up at an airport with Channel 7 in an exclusively arranged interview is frankly and quite pathetic. Why the AFL did nothing then, I've been saying it for two years, still baffles me. The, the cover-up, though, Craig, has been astonishing, and let's just have a look at some of it. Rory Sloan thought it was the best camp he's ever been on. Tex Walker thought it was the best thing he's ever done and recommends family and friends. The Crouch brothers have said that. Rory led just signed a three-year deal. They're all happy. I think people like Kane Corns and Damien Barron, they want a blow-by-blow blow account of what happened on the camp, and they're not going to get that. And the fact that players haven't come out and slammed it proves that it, <laughs> there's nothing to slam. They, they think there is, but there's not. Some of the stuff that I've heard out there, none of it is true. Uh, there's nothing that's gone on in that camp that I haven't attended on you know, business conferences and strategic days. What I believe went on on the camp has been grossly over-exaggerated. You know, some of the stuff that's been uh, thrown out in the, in the media landscape about what happened on the camp or what happened uh, in that program is just, it's farcical really. Everything taken out of context can sound a bit weird, but when you're there, it's pretty normal. There is no lingering issues um, out of the camp. So that is categorical. It's just hard to watch, looking back on those comments now, to what we have seen now. And for the AFL and the AFL Players Association and elements of people at Adelaide to come out and say that we actually had no idea that this stuff was going on. They either knew about it, Hutchie, and they deliberately lied, or they didn't know. I'm not sure which one's worse. Are you disappointed that Josh Jenkins, for example, who said on Friday, I told them to dig deeper, that, you know, in fairness to the Players Association, they did speak to Josh and he wouldn't tell them? Um, are you disappointed that... And I understand it was going to be a big deal and he spoke on SEN about not wanting to burn his house down, etc. Are you disappointed, and obviously it had affected you, Sam, that maybe the players weren't more honest with the Players Association when they were questioned or should they have questioned them more thoroughly? This, this is classic victim-blaming. The last people that are responsible for what went on at that camp are the players. No, it, no it, I agree it, with it's, that. It's, it's, it is absolute garbage to think that we could sit here and label any of those players as part of the problem. And yet when people come out and speak the truth that show great courage, by the way, we suddenly turn around the responsibility on them. If the AFL Players Association wanted to know what was going on in that camp, they could have asked. Because from where we sat, Carrie, it wasn't that hard to find out. I think they were asking... I do think that they should have brought in Indigenous liaison officers at the very least to talk to Eddie Betts and those other, those other Indigenous players who either quit the club or quit footy as a result of it. Well played by you, Sam. Been absolutely the driver of this story and continue to do that. As we move on to other issues uh, around the Adelaide Football Club and decisions they're going to make, there's no doubt they need some good news at that football club. That good news may come on the signing of Isaac Rankin. It appears very likely that they will secure his signature. I wonder whether it's the right move, Lordo, to make him the highest paid player in Adelaide Crows history and to come in on a contract worth $4 million over five years and could they explore other opportunities to get similar results for a much 
cheaper price. And I look at Tyson Stengel there with 39 goals. I look at the price you pay for Cody Waitman and others. They've drafted Ned McHenry and Josh Rochelle with first round draft picks recently. Do they uh, invest in those or do they pay a massive price to get Rankin? The only way I'd do that is if they believe Rankin can end up being a midfielder. A midfielder who can go forward, like Petrarca type. You know, he's mm. not the size of that, but... Um, they just drafted Rochelle, as you touched on. So he's a similar type player. May not ever be as good, but he could po quite possibly be. So to pay, if you're saying the highest paid player ever that's a forward pocket, half forward, and a good one at that, that's, uh, that's the wrong decision. Yeah, it's the contract thought. con, Hutchie, where clubs overpay just because a player is available. The do you think the circumst con. circumstances of the club and the need to do something... I th do you think they've been lured in by the story as opposed to the outcome? It appears that way from the outside. And when you say highest ever, what do you say? So who... who... Well, I'm not, I can't think of a player, because Adelaide historically have yeah. underpaid their players, right back to the McLeod days. But look, right now, Jordan Dawson would be on a con big contract. Rory Sloan would be the same. But he's going to come in next year with not achieving that much as their highest paid it'll be, player. It'll be front-ended too to get it out of the way before they get any good.